the future is in social media and short form content and very snackable content and stuff like that. But that's just not true. That's just proven not true at all. People want that, but people also want to go very, very deep on things and love, love going deep on everything. Welcome to the Backcountry Marketing Podcast. My name is Cole Heilborn. Today, I'm sitting down with John Peabody. He's the director of branded content at Gear Patrol Studios. John, how are you? Cole, I'm doing really well. Thanks so much for having me, man. Yeah, thank you for joining this conversation today. Um, where do we find you? How's your day going? Uh, day's going well. I'm here in Brooklyn, uh, you know, working from home. It's a nice day. And uh, I'm well caffeinated, so I feel ready to go for, uh, I guess, my first podcast ever. Well, maybe. I mean, we were just talking about this before we started to record, and you've done quite the radio. You've had quite the radio background, and so I, I think you're probably fairly qualified for a podcast if you've been on the radio. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks. I'll, I'll try. Um, it's true. I've done some radio. Uh, done some photography, done some video and stuff. And it, it's all kind of blurring, I guess, now into just general content. Um, but this feels very professional seeing you on this special software here and everything. So um, I don't know. I'm going to try not to be too intimidated here. <laughs> so you said you're in Brooklyn. How long have you been based there? Is that where Gear Patrol is located? Well, I yeah, I've been here in New York 10 plus years, 11 years. I sort of stopped counting. Um, Gear Patrol was in New York. Um, during the pandemic, they disbanded the office, went fully remote. We've had a few guests on the show who have been based out of New York. And I love it when there's an outdoor company based in New York because it seems like this super neat hybrid of like meshing of cultures and... The people are always super fascinating. Uh, and so it seems like a really, really unique place to work from. Well, it is. And I I mean, if you don't live here or you're not from New York, it, you know, you probably get the sense that New York is like, you know, Manhattan and this like skyscrapers and busy and crazy and grinding and all that kind of stuff. And it is that. But it's also a lot of other things. It's like Brooklyn and it's trees and parks and it's Rockaway Beach and surf um, and it's hikes nearby in New York and um, accessibility to ski mountains not too far away and plenty of parks. So, I, you know, I'm not going to say it's like the best beach town in the world or the best mountain town in the world or anything like that, but we do have our fair share of outdoor activities. I sort of consider myself not a city person at all, even though I've been here for 10 years and I guess I am technically like a New Yorker. I just don't even identify as one weirdly. <laughs> well, that, I, I guess I guess that makes sense, sort of. I'm curious to learn a little bit more about your job. So Gear Patrol, ha there's, a, there's a division under Gear Patrol called Gear Patrol Studios. Could you explain a little bit about what the studio does and what your role uh, as director of branded content, what, what, that, what that means? Yeah, definitely. So Gear Patrol is obviously a media company. You know, we do reviews, product journalism, reviews, lifestyle content, all sorts of stuff. And Gear Patrol Studios is our in-house branded content studio. So um, we create a ton of different um, partnership programs with various clients. Um, too many to name, but I'll, I could name a bunch. Um, and we create content um, in partnership with uh, various, various advertisers. I work really closely with our creative director, whose name is Joe Ternotsky, who's really, really talented, um, and basically just see ideas from, or program ideas from ideation through completion, basically. Gotcha. And what type of deliverables, what type of content is the team producing? So, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, everything from fairly turnkey shorter articles um you know a client could sponsor what is called today in gear which is our daily sort of um wrap up of the day in gear news um 
all the way to sponsored video series. Um, we've pitched podcasts recently. We haven't produced a sponsored podcast. Um, but really anything that we can come up with, um, we'll produce it. Gotcha. So how does that structure work? So a brand might come to Gear Patrol and say, we want to collaborate on this piece. And then is the studio built in a way so that you then automatically create those deliverables or is that, are they, are they a separate, uh, a separate channel? Well, yeah, I guess, what do you mean by separate channel? Let me clarify that. Yeah. So, um, do you work, I guess, how do you work with the gear patrol umbrella above you? And then how does that work in tandem with the brands that gear patrol is collaborating with? Yeah. Okay, sure. So, I mean, what, the way it generally happens, and it happens different ways, but um, brands will send work with our sales team and, and they'll give us an RFP or a request for a proposal. Um, and in that RFP, they'll tell us sort of what they're trying to achieve, what their budget is, what their timing is, etc. Um, and it might be, you know, something like maybe their KPI is brand awareness or maybe their KPI is they really want to sell this product and actually just convert people on this product. Whatever their KPI is, like we'll kind of huddle the creative strategy team and we have a dedicated creative strategist who I work with very closely and we have a sort of a pre-sale brain trust or whatever that gets together and comes up with a strategy for this client. Okay, we want to like convert people for this watch brand. We want to drive people to this landing page and get people to buy this watch. What's the best way to do it? We'll kind of come up with the plan that we think is the strongest at their budget level. Um, put it in a proposal, deck it up, send it to the brand, um, pitch it to them. Um, they love it, of course, you know, and then <laughs> they, they, they buy it. Um, and then, yeah, we work with the production team to kind of make it happen. And then as far as like how that works with the greater gear patrol team, there's obviously like, we have a, a ton of editors at gear patrol who are always producing content and our content lives in the gear patrol ecosystem is clearly labeled sponsored content. Um, you know, we're not trying to deceive anyone that this is content that the editors created that's different. Um, but it lives in the same ecosystem and is promoted in the same ecosystem, is found next to the content that the editors created. Um, so it's very much, um, well, I, I have a sort of point of view on sponsored content that since it's sponsored, it has to be really good and it probably has to sometimes be better than even the content the editors are producing in order to um, get the attention and, uh, I don't know, yeah, get the attention from the audience that um, you're trying for. If it's worse or it doesn't feel like um, there was effort put into it or it's just like not produced well, then it's really, really easy to write it off as like, oh, that's just sponsored content, that's an ad, that's branded content. Um, so, I don't know, I try and I, I think I speak for everyone at Gear Patrol Studios that when we produce something, we're really trying to produce something that's like even better than editorial, if we can do it, um, to make it stand out and kind of win win attention. That makes sense, because it, it, especially in today's age, anything that's sponsored content automatically like loses a few points of quote unquote credibility. Yeah. So you have to overcome that by overachieving on the level of quality or the creative or the story behind it all in order to make the make up for that gap between um, like user generated or editorial or sponsored content. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, one thing that's actually really great about that is because it's branded content, there's normally a budget associated with it that there might not be if the editor was producing, if an editor was producing that content. So, you know, we sort of like have the, um, uh, what's the right word I'm trying to think of, uh, like luxury of being able to work with a lot of creative partners, photographers, video makers, you know, illustrators to really like plus up the content and, and make it look beautiful and make it feel premium, which is kind of one reason I love sponsored content and producing it. I, I came from a background in journalism. 
Um, but I really enjoy the sponsored content world just because there is budget to kind of do things really well. Yeah. Yeah. Th- really quick. Let's just touch on your background. Um, yeah. how did you end up with gear patrol? Yeah. So, um, I'm a journalist by trade, um, by training, um, got my start working at newspapers, uh, a long time ago. Um, sort of went to grad school for journalism after working at a newspaper, moved to New York to become a journalist in the big city, sort of swashbuckling reporter was my dream. Um, Ended up working at Reuters, which is like the biggest news agency in the world. One of, I don't know, 5,000 journalists there or something. Was commuting into Times Square every day, sitting in a cubicle. And it like, to be honest, just wasn't my vision of what... um, a career in journalism was or should be or, or not what it was or should be but just what I wanted um, and I left Reuters kind of struck out on my own to be a freelancer um, writer and editor and while I was doing that while I was freelancing I started working for brands as well I had a blog and I was shooting some photos and naturally sort of just started doing some content work for brands Huckberry was one of them that was really good to me and I did some projects with them. Um, did some work with like Kaufman Mercantile, which was an old e-commerce brand. Um, and eventually I just was sort of only working with brands, um, just more profitable than trying to be a freelance writer and kind of realized like if I'm doing this full time for brands, I should probably just go in house somewhere and just work in branded content. Um, and get health insurance and stuff like that. Um, And I got a job at The Atlantic doing creative strategy, which was amazing. And it was the first time I was kind of doing creative strategy full-time, pitching clients, um, coming up with ideas for branded content campaigns, um, selling them through. There's a lot of similar sort of muscles you use as a journalist or editor, but they're like slightly different. You're pitching Um, someone with a commercial interest and you have to make sure things have commercial value and commercial appeal Um, and like I said before you you get budget to actually produce content Um, and I just really liked it honestly Um, I like sort of how it was built off of storytelling but slightly different Um, and anyway I was at the Atlantic for a couple years went to Hodinkee, the watch blog, um, where I was kind of running branded content there as well. Um, and then eventually was producing, uh, running the photo and video teams. Um, left, I guess about a year ago and made my way to Gear Patrol earlier this year. Um, and I've been in Gear Patrol for almost a year now, um, running Gear Patrol Studios. Awesome, congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. (laughs) So when we first connected, we started talking about the attention economy and how the attention economy is changing, maybe how it's not changing. And I'm curious just to kind of dive into your perspective on the attention economy. How, How would you how would you describe it? How would you define it in today's world? Yeah, I mean, this is like a a great question and like such a big sort of topic to talk about. Um, There's a couple things going on, I would say, with the attention economy um, that are sort of contradictory and interesting and notable, etc. There's like two major things I think are really interesting and sort of incongruent. One is the desire for like short form content, which is happening. And we see like TikTok is huge, right? And TikTok is so popular and the videos are very, very short and range from being like highly produced to very sort of amateurish. It almost like doesn't matter. Um, They're super engaging. And I don't know about you, but when I open up TikTok, I'm like all of a sudden like 45 minutes is gone or like an hour (laughs) is gone and I've watched like, I don't know, like 20, 30 videos. So like, that's amazing and that's happening and that's very interesting to me. Um, On the other end of the spectrum, there's very much like a crazy demand for long form content um, and content that goes much deeper. And I think you see that with obviously the insane explosion of podcasts over the last couple of years. Um, long form video on YouTube is super popular. 
Um, I mean, 30 minute, 40 minute, hour long videos on YouTube are like super popular. Um, and like long form writing too is popular. Um, you know, subscriptions are up at places like the New York Times, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, all these uh, news outlets that do long form reporting. There's very much a desire for that content as well. So, you know, for a, for a while, people were, were kind of like writing off long form content that like the future is in social media and short form content and very snackable content and stuff like that. But that's just not true. That's just proven not true at all. Um, people want that, but people also want to go very, very deep on things and love, love going deep on like everything. Um, so, yeah. I mean, as an aside, like I was talking to some people I work with last night about paranormal podcasts. I, like this is not my world at all. Like this is not my interest. Um, but there were like three people who were obsessed about paranormal podcasts and we showed, we fired up the app or the phone and there's like dozens and dozens of long form podcasts all about paranormal activity. So like no matter what you're interested in, there's tons of long form content where you can go like crazy deep on it. Um, so like, what does that say about the attention economy? Like, I don't know. Does it say like, our attentions are sort of like all over the place and, you know, range from short to long form, I guess. I mean, I just think we're, um, I think the, maybe the through line is just, we have attention for something that's really interesting. And it doesn't matter if that's short or long or medium or a podcast or a video or an article, if it's done well, if it's content that's created well and is interesting, like people will consume it, people will find it, and people will consume it voraciously. Um, and I guess I think that's kind of fascinating um, and something I think about all the time as a marketer. Um, yeah, so I was trying to wrap my head around, you know, short form or long form, regardless, like how much content is being created out in the world. And I'm sure we've all read some some stats about that, but I pulled a couple just to bounce off of you. So uh, the first one is on average per day, people are exposed to about 6,000 to 10,000 advertisements. Second, That's crazy. Second. That's the, I, my just reaction is like, oh my God, I can't even believe that, but I believe it. So, I didn't believe that at first, but then as I was looking at the website that I was pulling this stat from, I realized that there was three pop-up ads all around me and they were cycling through like every three seconds. And so I think in that moment, I was exposed to about 15 ads in a span of 30 seconds, 60 seconds, um, which I just found really ironic. <laughs> yeah. Second point was by 2025, it's estimated that 463 exabytes of data will be created each day. And I had to look up what an exabyte is. An exabyte is 1 billion gigabytes. Like, I don't even, I can't even fathom what that is. I just know it's a ton. <laughs> yeah, like I can wrap my head around a terabyte. Sure. 10 terabytes. But yeah, that's, that's like, that's next level. And that's every day. The last stat is currently in every 24 hour period, 1 billion hours of content on YouTube are watched. Crazy. I mean, yeah, it, those are like mind boggling numbers to the point of like, you, you almost like can't wrap your head around them. I don't know how you would, but also like totally intuitive because anyone who has a phone knows that it's a constant, just like feed of information into your brain. Um, and is daunting like i don't know anyone who doesn't have a phone right now who doesn't have sort of a complicated love hate relationship with it um <laughs> it's simultaneously great and totally draining at the same time um which i think content in general is and a lot of content is advertising um and these devices are like obviously heavily monetized um and i don't know i guess that my initial reaction to all that is almost like that just makes me feel more committed and like almost ownership of like creating good content um, that actually stands out and doesn't just become 
one of 6,000 advertisements that you see in a day and totally forget about because you've been totally overwhelmed with um, images of, you know, products and travel locations and whatever. Um, yeah, we're in, like, we're in sort of a Tower of Babel situation. There's just endless noise. Um, that's part of the attention economy too, right? Yeah. So how do you, when you think about like how to break through the noise and, and you alluded to it earlier, you said, regardless if it's long form or short form, what we're seeing is people are consuming interesting content, whatever interesting is to someone. Yeah. How do you think about breaking through the noise? How do you, how do you try to create something that is interesting so that it does stand out? So you're not one of those 6,000 ads. Yeah. I mean, as someone with a background in journalism and is passionate about journalism, I take a lot of the lessons from that world into creating content. Um, so for me, it's like stories of human interest, human led narratives, narratives in general, um, telling stories about people, um, the backstories of products, um, using the tools of a journalist like really good photography, really good video production, sharp writing. Um, these are things that sort of, they're just good quality production techniques that make things, I don't know, interesting is kind of a cop out word, but make things interesting to me. Um, and um, that's sort of the trade craft of content um, is just, hot, producing things as highly as possible as you can. Um, and I don't know, I think, I think if you think about things almost as a journalist who journalists are fighting through all this noise as well all the time, um, have been for a long time, um, the lessons from that world are, are easily applied to creating content. And that's how I approach things. That's definitely not the only way to approach things, um, but I am not like, I'm not an influencer. I don't, I don't really buy into influencer marketing too much. I mean, I think there's probably a place for it. And, and I wouldn't say I would never work with influencers or anything like that. I actually, I have, um, but it's not the, it's not one of the mediums or like tools in my handbag that I want to use if I'm trying to like really tell a story or let people know about a product or a service or something like that. Um, it's not like... I don't know, the 10 second video on TikTok isn't, isn't what I want to produce. I want to go deeper. I want to go a little bit longer um, and hopefully do something a little bit more impactful. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of just where I come from is just quality, quality storytelling, basically. Yeah. So maybe one way I'm trying to wrap my head around this is like, what about humans makes us you know, one hour, we would just want to consume TikTok and zone out for half an hour. But then the next hour, we want to sit down and listen to a three hour podcast about aliens. Like what about uh, what about us allows us to transition so quickly? And what about us finds both of those formats entertaining? Oh, my God. Well, I mean, we contain multitudes. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, you know, like this is kind of a cop out, but like we're just social creatures. Like we, we've evolved around storytelling, and I think we storytelling is probably one of the oldest, I don't know, forms of entertainment we have. Uh, you know, like I don't know, I don't want to say something cliche. Like we were cavemen sitting around a fire, like telling each other stories, but you know, we probably were, and that's in our DNA as humans, and like how that comes to life now is crazy, you know, through phones and short videos on TikTok and stuff like that, but also um, very deep, much more immersive tools like podcasts um, and long form video and movies and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I would say, I, I almost, I, I'll go out on a limb and say like even great TikToks like podcasts or like great movies have characters and have conflict and there is a narrative to them. Um, 
I think that's probably one of the ingredients of great TikTok is just those elements of storytelling as well. So I don't want to totally discredit short form content, even though it's not my my bag in producing it. I I definitely enjoy it. Um, and I think that those elements, I guess, sort of have to be there as well. And maybe that's what maybe that's what the sort of unifier is between long and shorter form content is just like conflict, characters, narrative. If those are there, then you can kind of hook people in. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm also thinking about it like before, before all the technology existed to, because there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a format and a piece of technology that meets us in every single spot in our life. Uh, like it fits whatever we're doing in our life. Like if I'm on the bus, you know, maybe I'm on TikTok, but if I'm at home on the couch, maybe I'm going to pop open YouTube and I'm going to watch a documentary. And maybe, you know, before we had all of these different formats, there was only so many ways that we could consume something, either verbally, maybe reading the newspaper, reading a book, a magazine, etc. And maybe now there's just, there's just so many more ways to tell a story that it makes us inundated because we can be consuming a story at any moment throughout our day. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. Um, a hundred percent agree. And the phone is like, that's kind of why we have the love hate relationship with the phone, right? Is it's the thing that allows us to access all this great stuff, um, storytelling or, you know, touching base with your family or maps or music or like whatever it is. Um, but also what comes with it is like almost that overwhelming sort of, uh, I don't know, attention grab that it is. I mean, it's grabbing for your attention at all times. Um, and yeah, geez, that's kind of the like the double edged part of being a content marketer, content producer these days is um, you're competing with that um, and you're trying to stand out and not just be noise. You know, like I don't know anyone who wants to just add to the noise right um or the chaos at least i don't want to and i don't think good marketing does basically yeah yeah that, that's a that's a very introspective question because if you were to really examine each of the work that each of us are doing are we really cutting through the noise or are we just adding to it like this podcast is it is it truly cutting through or are we just adding to the hundreds and thousands and millions of hours of podcasts that already exist well this podcast clearly no <laughs> this podcast is right. rising above and delivering a premium experience uh, to an engaged <laughs> audience who appreciates it. So no, clearly we are not just adding to the noise right now. <laughs> um, so I'm curious with your time, you know, over your career history, how have you seen companies and brands react and start to shift to just the change in the attention economy that we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years. What things have you noticed? I mean, there's like major sort of, I don't want to call them like epochs or whatever of technology over the last, I guess I've been creating content or journalism for like 20 years now. Um, and so there was like the rise of social media, which was crazy, Facebook and Twitter. And it seemed like this is the new dawn um, and this is the new way um, that we're going to consume content and everything is going to be through Facebook and Twitter and eventually Instagram. Um, and that seemed like kind of the, the way it was going to be for a while. Um, without like getting too granular, like that's been until fairly recently, I think. Um, and now it feels like those... Um, Oh God, do I want to say like paradigm shift? Like there's been a major shift of like how we are generally not just thinking about, but actually consuming um, social media. Um, I think the last six months to a year is, or even like the last three months have been really telling, you know, like we've all sort of like had these conversations about social media and the attention economy and, you know, felt this sort of overwhelming sense of like, God, I'm looking at my phone all the time. But in the last like couple months, like Facebook and Twitter are sort of like really, it, it people are beginning to have conversations like, is this the end of social media? Like new users aren't going to Facebook, younger users aren't going to Facebook, they're not going to Instagram. Twitter is like total chaos, like partly 
thanks to Elon Musk. Like it's total chaos and people are jumping to Twitter ship and going to like Mastodon or like, I don't even know what other new places they're finding. Um, they're certainly going to Substack. Like a lot of people are just have Substacks and are getting their news and information from Substack. So people are like genuinely rejecting social media now uh, in a way that they haven't for a long time. All this, of course, TikTok is super popular. I know TikTok's growing like insane. So like, I know it's very hard to make blanket statements, but um, I think there's no doubt this rejection of sort of social media happening right now. And I don't think it's going away. I don't think it's fully dying, um, but we're at a, a really, really interesting point now of like, what is the next phase of content consumption or whatever look like um and it feels less and less like social media like it's not going to be social media um i don't know does that kind of answer your question i, I kind of forgot what you ask even i i mean we're john right now we're in the deep end so there's no right or there's wrong no, answer. okay good okay <laughs> so you mentioned in the last two to three months you've been seeing trends about folks moving away from social is that just is that just related to Twitter or are there other things that you're aware of that are contributing also? Well, I mean, Facebook, I think it's like pretty well reported that they're struggling. Facebook as in meta, Facebook and Instagram um, are struggling to attract younger audiences. They're just not going to those platforms. I mean, that's like the big challenge for meta right now and why they're investing in the metaverse, right? Like the idea is the next operating system of the internet will be some kind of like metaverse type experience and they're making that big play so they own the next operating system in 10 or 15 years or whatever. Like, I don't know, I'm not smart enough to know at all if that's true. Um, I think it's interesting that they're making a giant gamble as a company and I think that in itself is a giant tell for meta. Like we are losing market share and we recognize that it's such a big problem that we're willing to make such a giant gamble on some totally uh, TBD underdeveloped product technology that like, frankly, we don't know if people really want or will embrace, but we need to do something. And like, I don't know. I mean, I kind of like, I have a complicated relationship with social media, like I think like everyone, but I, I give a lot of credit to, I don't know if it's Zuckerberg or the people in power at Facebook, um, decision makers, that they're willing to make like such a big gamble. I feel like you don't see a lot of companies who are sitting on like billions of dollars make such audacious sort of gambles, like let's bet the whole company on the metaverse, like that doesn't happen that often. Yeah, like let's let's bet six million six billion dollars and invest yeah. towards this thing. Yeah, and I like I, I don't know like are we gonna all be wearing headsets in six years and eight years? Like, geez, I don't think so. But like also, I wouldn't have bet that Facebook would have been a thing six years before Facebook Facebook launched. So like I don't, I don't know, you know. Yeah, interesting. So YouTube is a platform that stands out to me as I mean since like two thousand and eight or whenever it was founded has, has been like steady rock yeah. solid. Yeah, it's true. What, what, have, but they're not, but they're, I mean, they're always improvising. They're always adapting, but they're not making any Hail Marys like Facebook is. What, if you had to compare the differences between Facebook and YouTube, what are they and why is YouTube a more stable platform, you know, around the attention economy and, and kind of everything we've been discussing? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, and as we were like, right before you were going to ask that question, YouTube popped in my mind is like, that's kind of the other, like sort of elephant in the room. I mean, I don't know, maybe it's that you, YouTube is more of a platform for um, delivering content than Facebook is. Um, I mean, I have YouTube on my TV um, and watch YouTube there. I have YouTube on my phone. Um, and it's also, it's not a, it's not, people call it a social network and I just don't think YouTube is a social network. In previous roles I had, when we were reporting like social growth internally, YouTube would get thrown in. And I was just like, this doesn't belong here. Like, 
I don't have friends on YouTube that I'm interacting with. I have people I follow, but they're just like channels like ESPN and Casey Neistat or whatever. Um, so I don't know. I'm sure there's someone who can argue that to me convincingly or the opposite of, um, of that convincingly to me. Um, I don't know. YouTube is... YouTube is such a whale on the internet and I love it so much. I really genuinely love YouTube. I love like the breadth of content there. Um, I love the quality of content there. There's a lot of like stuff I will never, like 99% of the stuff I won't ever consume, but the fact that I can go deep on um, the weirdest, most curious things um, is amazing. And it's not part of, um, well, there's an algorithm, but it's not like part of a news feed where I'm getting a lot of other stuff from it. Um, it's like I literally go in and I can get what I want. Um, it's pretty good at knowing what I want um, without being really noisy too. Um, so I don't know. I, I guess it's kind of like a different beast than Facebook. Um, and uh, it's a giant search engine too, right? I mean, like, I don't know about you, but when I'm searching for something on the internet, oftentimes it's just at YouTube like I'm literally looking for a video of how to like I don't know sharpen a knife or like how to do something I go to YouTube to do it um, so that's a huge value proposition there that doesn't exist it's it's almost like more comparable to Google Maps right like it's just an amazing resource of information um, than it is a social network to me and I, I I don't think I'm alone in using it that way. Um, yeah. I mean, just this morning, I was looking up how to change the heat shield on my wife's Subaru exhaust. <laughs> That's a fun project. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's rattling and uh, I need to swap it out. But where do I go to figure out how to do that? Quick YouTube search and... I can find the make and model and I mean everyone everyone knows how that works. Yeah, totally. There's some there's some guy who's like got the exact car and has done it step by step in like 45 seconds and you're like the internet's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So if it doesn't for you if it doesn't fit in the social media camp, where does it belong? I like I don't I don't know. That's a really good question. It like I, I a platform you know, for distribution, but that also undersells it. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I guess it kind of defies categories in my mind. Um, and to be fair, it is social, like people use it as a social media. I mean, like, listen, like if I was Casey Neistat, I would probably see YouTube as a social platform, telling your story, sharing it with people. Um, people liking it, people commenting, like that is very much a social platform in that sense, but that's not how I use it. Um, so I guess it's a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Do you feel like brands in the industry today are fully capitalizing on the potential of YouTube? Some are. Um, yeah, I mean, some for sure, some not. Um, it, yeah. That's the easy answer. I mean, it's, I think to capitalize on, on it fully, you have to like fully embrace producing video, which is not easy, as you know, um, and good video. Um, and like anything, if you're going to do it, you kind of have to like fully commit to doing it, basically. Otherwise, it's just not even worth it, basically. Yeah, your your investment time is years of work. And I you know, you see so many brands on YouTube, but I don't know that I think the ones that are doing it really well, like the audience knows what to expect. Like they've been trained to consume whatever it is per per the brands. But there's a lot of brands out there that I don't know that have have really trained themselves or trained their audience to consume what they're creating. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's why you see poor engagement on a lot of platforms or on a lot of channels, you know, brand platforms. Yeah, I think that's a good good point. I mean, who who's doing YouTube like really well? What's a brand that's doing YouTube really well in your opinion? I mean, the easiest, easiest uh, example is like Patagonia. Yeah. I mean, but, I, you know, they're kind of they're kind of an exception because 
Well, they're not even an exception. They they they, they do an amazing job. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they do great stuff, and they they train their audience to know what to expect there. Like, we're going to do some sort of, like, slower docu-style films about the environment and um, sort of, like, environmental justice and stuff like that. I Like, yeah, I love it. Um, I mean, Yeti comes to mind for me, like, as just killing it with YouTube and video in general. Um, and I think, you know... Like Yeti's been doing these really good documentaries for a while. And I think I remember the first time I watched one of their documentaries, I don't even know which one it was, which had nothing to do with coolers at all. Like absolutely nothing to do with coolers. I was like, why is Yeti doing this? Like what, why, why did Yeti just produce this like crazy, really, really good video um, that's on par with anything you'd see at a film festival anywhere? And I guess because they had a film festival, maybe they were promoting. I don't even really know the backstory. But now they've trained their audience, people on YouTube, to expect really super high quality videos on their YouTube channel. And they like pretty consistently deliver um, really amazing storytelling, high production value, um, stuff you like don't expect from Yeti. And... Uh, I don't know. I, I'm sort of consistently impressed with them. Definitely, yeah. I, I, we've always, I've always looked up to them. Like they, they do phenomenal work. And one day, you know, I'd, I'd love to have the opportunity to work with them. Yeti, uh, so, call Cole. Give Cole a call. <laughs> Come on, let's do this. Thank, thank, thanks, John. Yeah. I appreciate the plug. Um, so that's an interesting idea. I, I'm thinking now about. I'm kind of speaking out loud here. I'll see if my thought lands. Um, I'm thinking now about like the difference between short form and long form content and like the um, the investment expectations of each of those types of content. And, you know, in the short attention span uh, economy that we're in, like the goal is mass content, frequent, constant content that hopefully has a high return on, you know, I post something, I see a sale. I post five things and I see, you know, five sales. So we've been almost, you know, I wonder if our, our brands, do they expect, is the expectation to see quick returns on short form pieces of content? And then I guess I'm comparing that to like long form content, which seems like a much longer play, a much more, you know, brand play rather than the short return. Yeah, sort of brand expectations and versus the um, content execution or like short form, long form piece of content and what do they expect? I think this is a really good thing to talk about because I think there's, there's almost like this misconception or not misconception, but like misunderstanding of what different pieces of content can do for you or your brand and it's not always like moving product. Um, that can be the value of one piece of content, but it might not be the value of say like a long form video, which might be more about building brand awareness or getting people to find you on YouTube, for example. Um, so I think there's a lot of nuance and I think this is a really critical part of creative strategy is just like knowing what tools are in your bag and which ones are effective at doing which. Um, so if a client or a brand wants to say like move a lot of like sweatshirts, they're selling sweatshirts or something like you're probably not going to spend like six months making like a long form documentary about some like fishermen in Argentina or something, you know, it just doesn't make sense. But you might like sponsor an article at Gear Patrol or somewhere else, you know, wherever it is um, that talks about some of like the finer points and like design points and um, I don't know, elements of the sweatshirt to get people to know about it. Um, or you might just post a sponsored post on Instagram and maybe that's enough to do it. Um, so it just comes down to like, what do you, what are you trying to achieve? And, you know, it's the marketing funnel that we all like kind of talk about and know about, but it's always good to keep in mind. Um, 
And I would say, and I don't, I don't want to sound like too self-serving or like I'm trying to plug Gear Patrol or whatever, but I would just say like in general, I think publishers are really, really well positioned for this reason because you can own a lot, you can like kind of move people through the funnel in a way that a lot of other like advertising partners can't. So like you can do bigger, deeper storytelling that builds awareness about a brand and then you can do sort of like, you know, shorter form stories that are sort of more about consideration, spe- considering specific products, um, you know, moving them down the funnel to like, here's an actual deal on this product, you know, like, and you can like buy this sweatshirt or this knife right now, maybe there's a discount or whatever, but here's like, here's where you go to buy it. Um, and I think that I'm super bullish on publishers and content marketing in general, branded content, just almost just for that reason, because you can you can enter into that funnel or that stream or whatever you want to call it and create different pieces of content in different places that help kind of move users, audience, people along um, in different ways. Um, that other that other like partners can't do um, or just don't have the op- ability to. And I think that's one of the benefits of of a of a publisher like Gear Patrol, you know. When a brand works with you, or when if as a as a customer, if I go to Gear Patrol, I might I might realize that what I'm reading or what I'm watching is sponsored content, and I I in the back of my mind I know oh this brand partnered with Gear Patrol, but there's there's some level of you know journalistic like unbias that seems to come with a site like Gear Patrol where I go there because I want you know a perspective on something that maybe. I really don't trust the brand to give me because they're too close. You know, they, they're the brand, they sell the product, but gear patrol is kind of this, I mean, you're really in many ways, an influencer. Um, you're just, you're just, the company is an influencer that people trust. I trust for quality reviews and, and quality products. So that, that separation between the brand and the consumer, I think is really valuable, especially in, in today's world where, you know, you, you carry that weight of authority. You have that, that perspective in the community that is trusted. Yeah, cool. I'm glad you. I'm glad you saying that because I think that's exactly sort of the point. Um, I think there's also there's an element. This is something I noticed when I was at Hodinki, you know, which is a watch website, watch blog, and e-commerce shop. Um, amazing site, amazing watches. Um, but like, I used to always wonder, like, do people do do people are people suspect of branded content? Um, on Hodinki because it's a watch shop, it's a watch blog, you know, do, do people trust branded content? And ultimately, like, what it came down to is, like, I actually think I thought about that a lot more than anyone who was looking at the content thought about it. Like, if you're into watches and you see interesting watch content, whether it's by the editors or sponsored by a brand, um it almost doesn't matter because you're just like, I'm just into this watch and seeing photos of this watch and learning about this watch. Like how, you know, how deep can I take it in the ocean? Or like, what's the backstory of it? Or like, what, how big is the, you know, the case or whatever. Um, so like, I, and I don't want to like write, I don't want to write off. I think it's important to like recognize that there's editorial content and branded content and they serve different purposes. But I also just think in general, like kind of when it comes to product journalism, people just like want to know about products and want to find out about cool products. Um, And it's sort of not like we're the New York Times and we're producing sponsored content on like some major policy thing like Exxon gave us money and we have some sponsored piece of content about how great um, oil and gas is for the future. You know, like that's a little bit more problematic than like, here's just a cool knife that you, hey, you might be interested in buying this thing if you're into knives. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's, I think it goes to say also like, it's important for a brand to have a partner like Gear Patrol, but also, you know, be their own sustaining, like thriving content machine. I'm thinking about, you know, like if I'm going to go, 
if I'm going to go, let's say, hire someone to fix my wife's car because I can't figure out the heat shield on YouTube, uh, probably what I'm going to do is, you know, I might ask for a referral from a friend, which is like getting a referral from Gear Patrol. And then I might go to that auto body or that, that mechanic shop and then look at their content or their website. And like both of them need to meet my expectations and answer my questions. Um, one without the other isn't as powerful. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's like a lot of brands have their in-house content studios now to do that. And, and they should, and they kind of like, they have to, cause everyone's a publisher now. Right. And this is like kind of to your question of like, who's doing, who's doing YouTube well and who's not. It's like, I don't know, some brands great, create awesome content and some others, it's really, really hard. It's just, a, it's hard to produce it. Yeah. So, so do you feel like branded content is a format that we should be paying attention to as we're trying to figure out how to cut through the noise that's out there? Well, I mean, I don't, it's like, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know totally how to answer it other than maybe, you know, if it, if it's good, um, or it provides value, like you're trying to change the heat shield in your car. And I don't know, maybe like the auto parts company or whatever created a video on how to do this, then like, that's great branded content or marketing content. It has like utilitarian value. Then like, yeah, you should pay attention to it. Or I don't want to tell anyone like they should or shouldn't do anything, but like that's helpful content. Um, but geez, like there's so much not helpful content out there. Like, right. Like there's, I don't want to say you should ignore other content, but people just do, you know, like, cause it's not interesting or not helpful. Um, so I don't know. Um, I personally just watch, consume what interests me. Um, and if it's branded or it's not branded, like at this point in time, where we are in the world and technology, like it doesn't really matter to me too much if Yeti produced a video or if the National Geographic produced a video or if the New York Times produced a video, if it's interesting and it's good, um, I'll watch it. I feel like I'm savvy enough to understand, okay, there's a, this agenda behind this video um, or whatever, and that's fine. So we've talked, uh, we've, we've mentioned a few different formats of branded content. We've talked a lot about video and film, podcasts, articles. I'm curious in your time, have you come across any other medium or format that isn't mainstream that you've noted and you're like, oh, that was a really interesting format or way that that content was delivered? That's a good question. Um, well, I mean, podcasts are interesting, you know, um, and there and there are some obviously branded podca podcasts out there more and more. A lot of them produce sort of in-house. Um, activations events are really interesting to me. Um, you know, The Atlantic, where I used to work, just had this giant event in L.A., um, and I forget the name of it, um, but it was a giant art installation and it kind of like created a forest inside a big warehouse. I didn't get to go. I wasn't in LA. I wish I had. Um, but that is like a giant branded event, um, that was sponsored, I think by like MasterCard. I could be getting this wrong. Um, but that's a total format breaker, um, and something that, people went to and because it was just interesting and creative and experiential and uh, there wasn't anything like that that had ever been done before. Um, so that's that's super interesting. Um, I don't know the details about like production or anything, but it was a big, big production. Um, so I don't know, events are always interesting totally different like um totally different beast um and i've been involved in a couple producing a couple like smaller ones um but yeah i think in situations like that sort of uh the opportunities are like endless i never thought about that as an event as a form of branded content but you bring it up and i mean it makes total sense and like those are 
we everyone's been going to events uh and it doesn't feel like i mean it's it's sponsored content yeah it's like a branded experience um and probably i think gonna see more of those now that we're all like covid's over or like over ish or like i don't know what the right way to describe covid is right now um but yeah I, i'm sure we'll see more of those um I'm trying to think of like other branded content formats that have kind of like stuck out to me. Um, I mean, you know, Netflix is really interesting branded content too. There's like endless product placement in Netflix, which we don't even really realize when we're watching it. Um, but that's, that's like a giant business that I don't feel like we really know a lot about. Most of us, even savvy consumers, of media don't even fully appreciate or understand how much of Netflix is actually branded content. And I think it's like a lot. Like, why is that Coca-Cola in there? You know, it's because Coca-Cola paid to put it there. Um, so yeah, I don't know. What about you? Are there any like formats you can think of or anything that's like notable to you? I'm really intrigued by, and, and I don't have an example, Yeah, but I'm really intrigued by like more experiential or more in-person experiences. Yep. And I guess like kind of a a sort of quasi example is, so a couple of years ago I purchased, I, I got a pair of um, like long johns, base, uh, base layers. And they showed up and like the box they showed up in was like this, its own experience in itself. It was, it was like super well created. The artwork was incredible. And you know, you open the lid and they're like, there's there's something you read and then like you go one layer deeper and there's something else and there's like a book and then there's like a picture. And then you eventually reach the product, but it was this, it was its own experience just unboxing the product, which I thought was like, it stuck out to me. And like, I've never, I've never, I've never purchased a product that has like intrigued me the same way as this base layer. And so obviously it's very different because I've already purchased the product and it's at my doorstep, but that that really stood out to me. Yeah, that's an interesting, I mean, that's like so many smart people really thinking about that exact moment, right? To make you feel uh, like this sense of wonder when you open a product, I think is pretty cool um, and interesting. Hence like a zillion unboxing video accounts on YouTube, <laughs> right? To that are exploring all that stuff. Um, yeah, it made me kind of think about how we think of going to stores now too um and that stores have obviously are like experiences and like a good store is an experience in itself especially here in new york they're almost like loss leaders for a lot of brands they know they're not like gonna really make money from the store but they want it to be sort of like almost an embassy for the brand a place where you can go experience the brand or whatever and like what it's all about um and the the box is like an extension of that too, that you should feel the brand, like the values of the brand at the store. And if you're not at the store, you should feel what the brand's about just by opening up the product at home. Um, I think that's super interesting. It's like not totally my world, but one that I really, really appreciate when it's done really well, for sure. Yeah. What about apparel? Yeah, what about it? I mean, I mean, we're all walking billboards. I don't know, you know, like I'm of a, I'm of a generation that doesn't want to be a walking billboard, and I do, personally don't like logos on me and buy very clothing that has very minimal logos. That's just me. I'm like not the normal person right now because I live in New York, and obviously, like younger people want to want to rep brands um and that is the that's fashion right it's like supreme you know written across my chest or whatever um like more power to you that's like not not what i want at all um even though i work in branded content like i don't want to be branded content you know yeah uh i'm just thinking about you know when you're on when you're skiing and you look up above the chairlift and you see the name of every ski manufacturer on the snowboard or the ski underneath. Yeah, I just wonder if there's like a way to take that further, you know? Like I see the Burton logo on the bottom of the snowboard, 
but is there a way to like let me continue that journey somehow while I'm on the ski hill? I don't know. I don't know either. Let's uh, let's pitch Burton on a program. <laughs> We're going to create a lodge on the side of the slope that's a Burton branded experience. I mean, they probably mm. wouldn't even be into it anyway. They're kind of like they don't need to. They probably don't even need to do branded content. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, though. Like a branded ski lodge. Yeah, I'm sure it's been done. I'm sure you know someone's done it, and you can have like Burton hot chocolate or something as you <laughs> warm your boots up in the Burton heat warmer or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. As I'm thinking about that, that might devalue my appreciation for the brand, though. That... Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that that's kind of a cool brand because they're sort of like a little bit of like, um, I don't know, like they cut their own path, you know and right. sort of anti-establishment. Yeah. Interesting. So we, we've discussed a lot. I'm curious, like, what what sticks out to you if you kind of had to sum things up as you look towards the future and just considering the various aspects we've discussed today? Well, um, you know, I can say a couple things about, like, where I think we kind of are and a little bit where things are going. I don't, I'm not, like, a... I don't want to pr try and predict the future because it can't be done. Um, but I think that there's like some notable things happening right now that if I was in marketing or advertising, like I'd be, I'm, I, there are things I'm paying attention to. And, and one is of course, like sort of the decline of social media and like Facebook is a big part of that and how Apple's privacy rules have affected Facebook and sort of so how we're consuming media and sort of the general sort of distrust or disharmony with with shorter form content and social media and stuff like that is happening. There's just we're just feeling like OD'd on it. Like asterisks, even though TikTok is growing and super popular, obviously. Um, so that's like one interesting thing. Um, and I think that there's a real interesting moment and opportunity right now for um, deeper, call it long form content, um, just higher quality content again, um, and for brands to produce it um, or, you know, whomever is trying to get a messaging out. I mean, even if it's like a political party or a nonprofit or whoever, um, there's an, there are sort of endless opportunities to tell deeper stories now that will actually be consumed and be appreciated and enjoyed by people. Um, and I don't think this is like a cutting edge idea, but it's just a trend we're seeing now that I am really, really appreciative of um, coming from a place like 10 years ago where it seemed like longer form content was like maybe gone. Like Magazines are disappearing. No one's watching documentary films or like whatever. And it turns out like, no, people actually do want this content. They do want longer form content. They do have long attention spans if what they're consuming is done well. Um, and that's like a, to me, a very interesting opportunity and, uh, like a very optimistic one, you know, that I feel very good about. Um, so I don't know if that kind of wraps, wraps it up, but that's where my head's at is kind of just like recommitting to this idea of producing really good, engaging content, um, that doesn't have to be five seconds long. So what does that mean for your team at the studio? It means that we just double down on doing things really well, working with really good photographers, spending time to design articles to make sure they look beautiful, making sure the copy is really well written and engaging, sharp, um, making sure that what we're putting into the world is good. Um, I think it has to be. Um, and it just is like a commitment to craft. I mean, creating content for you and myself is a craft. And if you enjoy it and respect it, then I think like that's the only way to do it, right? Is to like kind of do it well. Um, what's the point otherwise, you know? Yeah, yeah, well said. Well, 
that on that note of, of wrapping things up, you've given me some optimism about about the future. Yeah, I mean, it seems like like why wouldn't you want to make something that people remember? I guess like that that seems really obvious to me, but maybe maybe that's naive. Maybe I'm slightly naive. I don't think I don't so. Know. I don't think so. And I think like honestly, like that is to me the ultimate goal right there. Like if I can make a piece of content, a video, an article that is remembered. Like I might not always like couch success in these terms, but like that's ultimately what you want to do is like make something that people remember and think about. Like that's a, that's a huge success. If you can do that today, like you've won the content game. So here's another, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that thought and I'm running with it. It seems odd that that isn't a lot of our perspective on things. Like people only have I mean, the attention economy is built on the idea that our, our attention is a commodity. Uh, therefore, it's limited. I only have 24 hours in a day to, to, to consume something. So why have we made such an emphasis to create volume of content when we could be focusing on the deeper content uh, to, 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 you know, I guess I'm trying to connect those dots. Like I can either make a lot of content to stand out or I can make a couple pieces of content to really stand out. I think it's like almost like this, like there's like two ways of thinking about it. And this is like a gross simplification, but you could create like really short content that's just like designed to like grab someone's attention for a second. That's like almost the equivalent of like them yelling at you like, hey, like pay attention to me. And it's like, okay, you got my attention. What is it? And it's like, look at this pen. And you're like, okay, great. Like, great, cool. I just like broke my train of thought and I'm, but I am now seeing a pen, cool. Or you can try and do something that hits on like a deeper level um, and maybe makes you like, not even make you think more, but just like enjoy more or sit with a little bit more. And I don't even mean like a 30 minute video or something, but just something that's like slightly deeper. Um, and that's, that's the content that is gonna build a deeper like affinity for a brand and sort of build more trust and awareness. And like, that's the Yeti video or the Patagonia video or whatever, um, that's done really well. Um, that someone's going to talk about on a podcast, like years later, they're going to be like, yes, I remember watching this video six years ago. They're not going to talk about the little like loud piece of a con content that broke their attention and broke through the noise for a quarter of a second, but then just became the noise. Yeah, I love it. Let's 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 wrap things up there. Okay, John, if folks want to connect with you, they want to learn more about Gear Patrol Studios or find you personally, where can they go to connect? Yeah, if people want to connect, GearPatrolStudios.com or GearPatrol.com, hit us up. Of course, um, you can find me online, John Peabody. Um, Dot net is my website, um, but you know, Instagram, Twitter, I'm all over the place. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, Cole, this has been really fun. I really appreciate it. Likewise, I, yeah, I appreciate you being willing just to kind of jump in and dive into a topic that we're definitely not smart enough to understand, but you know, we just kind of bumble around in it and, and come up with some ideas. Folks, I'd highly encourage you to go check out John's website. We didn't touch on it at all, but you did a project with John Mayer um, a few years ago. It's very well done, very, very cool project. Uh, so I'll leave folks with that. Go check out John's website and uh, see what he's been up to. Um, John, thank you again for taking the time and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, man, my pleasure. Take care. Bye.